What if I described to you a car? Carbon fiber monocoque, rear wheel drive, hybrid, European, with suicide doors. That'd be pretty neat. And probably some sort of high-end exotic. Or it'd be one of these. A BMW i3. I actually know almost nothing about this car other than it belongs to a friend of mine and it has a dead 12 volt battery. Well, it had one, we actually changed it, but not yet because we're filming this after we changed it. So now we need to go back to when we change it. So, so Jake, Jake, take it away. Thanks, Jake. It's about an hour ago and we've got to get this car working before we can fix it. We just unloaded it off that U-Haul and pushed it about as far up the driveway as we felt like. So now we got to rip the whole front end apart and get the battery, which is under here. Oh, how convenient. We've already got the battery and all my tools in here. Wow, amazing. So the battery is so dead that we can't like, we can't even like unlock the or anything. <clears throat> okay, that is heavy. There's a lot of gravity packed in there. Uh, the tools that I'm told that we'll need are a four mil, uh, four mil hex, 10 mil ratcheting wrench, an extension, 10 mil socket, and of course the best tool ever made. So, electric car, huh? Well, that's neat. So let's see here, a couple of beauty panels that come off entirely too easy. <laughs> Beauty covers are off. Now we just got to take out the uh, extremely generous frunk. You can almost hold like one bag of groceries in here. So we got a couple of these torques at the bottom. That is Titan. Cool. I love this too, because I have to get up at 6.15 tomorrow to start filming the first Patreon video. I mean, so does Josh. He's coming with. <laughs> got my magnet basket that I never remember to use. Heck yeah. It'll work really good in this car since it's all over in carbon fiber. Yeah, I can't stick it to anything. It's very unfortunate. Ow. How did it travel that far? In normal cars, you could just get to the 12 volt battery. Okay, hang on, dump out your leaves. I've been keeping those for a long time. Okay, and that concludes the detailing segment. Let's see, so the battery's way back here. Uh, and this is pretty fragile looking. Twist, and out it comes. Set that somewhere where it's probably not gonna get smashed. And then this is where we need the 10 mil. Ah. Or the bracket. This job might actually be as easy as the internet said it would be. Of course, it's changing a battery, so I would certainly hope so. Yeah, but, but it's BMW, so. Yeah, who even knows? Okay, ratcheting wrench time. There's a, a 10 mil nut here for the negative terminal. And what you want to do is swing this towards the positive so you can short them together and do some welding. Except this battery is so dead that it won't even turn on an LED light, so I don't think that's actually a concern. That'll live there, that's fine. Well, there we go. Here's the positive. Funky little adapter guys. Now this seems easy to strip out by accident, so I'm gonna start these by hand. <laughs> and these are specific to positive and negative. I don't understand why these exist. Like, this is, this battery work is for nothing else, so why don't they just have the weird asymmetric terminals built into the battery? Also, you're screwing into like lead here, so uh, being gentle with the torque is the name of the game. So now, we can eat the old battery. I suggest throwing it into the ocean. It is a safe and legal thrill. Uh, installation's reverse removal, but now I gotta figure out how exactly to reverse what the hell I just did. Come on. Really, with the wiring harness, is this a GM car? Okay, positive. Yes, I am. I like that cute little voltage tap there. That's good and tight. 
which is the correct spec for a German car. And now you go back in there. So as soon as I put the negative on there, the alarm's gonna go off. So we've got a very oddly shaped key, and I guess I just mash the unlock button as I do this? Yep. Cool. There we go. Okay. It's alive. Mashed the heck out of it. Yeah, the car lives, so I'm sure all the radio presets are gone now, which is unfortunate. There weren't it's, any. That's, that's good, because terrestrial radio is garbage, especially in Wichita. <laughs> And that's the factory battery that we're replacing, right? So it's been in here for like eight years? Uh, it's a 2017, so four. Four years. That's about right. At least it didn't die prematurely or anything like that. Though I'd, I'd kind of expect with the amount of technology that's in this car managing the battery, it would last a bit longer because the car knows exactly how much charge to give it when and whatnot, instead of just an alternator dumping voltage at it. Battery tie down one. And then, battery tie down two. We should probably also note that we did disconnect the high voltage. Okay, so this goes that away. On. Okay, so now we gotta reconnect the high voltage, which I'm told is a pain. Push on the black and pull the retainer out. Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> Feel like I'm doing it wrong. I have a knife if that helps. And then down. Oh, down. Yep. That makes more sense. Okay. Okay, so this so the high voltage cut off. It's just a little jumper. That's kind of cute. All right, so then. Make sure I've got the red, I've got the red piece out all the way. So what I ended up having to do earlier was push the red oh. to the side. Oh, well, there we go. That was way easier than I've ever seen it done. Magic hands. There we go. Weird. Well, really much of a fit. Yeah, because now we've got to code the battery. Uh, but at least now I have my work table back. Cool. Well, my back hurts. Actually, what else is under here? Brake fluid. Yes. Yes. I'm guessing that's cool, and that's power steering fluid. Yes. So this is hydraulic power steering. That's interesting. So I'm guessing it just has a little motor-driven, electric motor-driven pump then. And then over here is washer fluid. Well, let's go get this in the light so we can properly admire it. Okay, so recoding is just done with the uh, the app. If we can find it, dimmer link. I'm guessing I need to turn the car on. Yes. Okay. Just so that's... Uh, only the one. So just don't use the brake. Just press the start stop button. Ooh, auto leveling LED headlights. Now the app does cost $36. 36? Or 35. Goodness. One of the two. So then you just go to 12 volt battery and it will try and connect and register new battery. Same capacity and type if you've kept it. Register. Nice. Successfully registered. Do we need to turn the car off and on again or something? Uh, we can, but I didn't ever see anything that says we have to. Okay. Let's get back to where we were before in the future, but not. Yep. Wow, I hate that guy. Anyway, that was a decent amount of work just to change a 12 volt battery. I don't know why they built it like that, but it's just one of the many quirks of a car like this. I mean, it's a carbon fiber commuter car that you can buy used for less than $20,000. How many cars like that are around? None, especially with tires this small. My shoe is as wide as this tire. Kind of hilarious. Kind of makes me wonder what this would do in an autocross. I'm guessing not well. You can't exactly buy RE71Rs for that. Can't buy RE71Rs for anything anymore. They discontinued them.
So because I'm really good at researching these videos, I did no research, and the sum total knowledge I have about this car is that I really like the color, and that it has a hybrid powertrain that includes, back here, a range extender that is a 600 and something cc scooter engine. It's about, it's about all I've got for you, so uh, Josh is going to be my walking, talking Wikipedia because I don't know, I, I don't know what any of this is. What, how much horsepower does it make? I do not know. Cool. <laughs> More than three. I hope people aren't coming to this video hoping for something informational. So, rear engine, rear wheel drive, just like a supercar. This is basically a supercar. It even has supercar doors. Look at that. Actually, how is the back seat? Terrible, actually. The back seat is basically useless. I mean, you can put like your backpack back there. I mean, I'd rather have it than not have it, but not exactly uh, in the lap of luxury back here. But this interior is super cool, but we'll get to it later because I'm not done with the exterior yet. Windows do a thing. They kick down here in the bottom, probably for better visibility out the back to make it feel less like you're sitting in a bathtub. I'm not really sure why they did any of that. But in the back, this entire hatch is made of glass, including this part. So if any of this cracks, you are just completely hosed. And then the taillights kind of look like they were drawn on with like a pen. It's really strange effect, but it stands out if nothing else. And then it looks like it's pooping out a Porsche 911 in the bottom, sort of like the, what is it, the i8? The i8's the same way, I think. Yes. They both look like they're pooping out Porsches. I don't know why they made that decision, but they did. What's kind of neat is the way the whole car kind of looks like it's a glass bubble that's just got the uh, body color panels wrapped around it. Kind of a neat look. All these panels, like a Fiero, can be removed, uh, which is really nifty. And let's see, if we open this up, we can get a better look at the carbon fiber weave that makes up the entire unibody shell of this car, which is pretty dang slick at this price point. And then security kicked us out. So I guess we're abruptly starting the driving portion of this. So this is a parallel hybrid, which is kind of my favorite kind. I am not a huge fan of series hybrids, which is like what a Prius is or what my Insight is, where an electric motor is assisting a gas engine, but it more or less drives like a gas car most of the time. This is kind of the opposite. It's more like a Chevy Volt, where it drives like an electric car almost all of the time and it has a gas range extender uh, to help you when you run out of electricity. So it's kind of the best of both worlds personally. I think it's the ideal powertrain setup for 99% of people if any company would bother to market it the proper way. Unfortunately in the US, the i3 specifically got completely nerfed by California's specific tax breaks. breaks and the requirements therein. In order to benefit for certain tax refunds and whatnot as an owner, the car itself has to have a gas range that is no longer than the electric only range. So what BMW did was they electronically limited the size of the fuel tank. When it got down to a specific point, the car would just shut off and I think that it was like two thirds of the actual physical capacity. Furthermore, the power of the electric motor was limited, I believe, and you couldn't go over certain speeds. Josh, explain this better than I can. Okay, so the range extender, if you get down to a certain percentage in the US, you have to get below, I believe it's 6% for it to actually kick on. Um, otherwise, it will just run on electricity. The problem with that is, is if you're going along doing 70 miles an hour on the highway or 75 and you get below a certain percentage, it will limit your speed to, I believe it's 45 miles per hour. So imagine all of a sudden being limited while you're on the highway and it's caused some accidents and several unsafe things, but I don't think they've actually done anything about it. However, in the European market, these cars have the hold state of charge feature, which below 75%, it will let you turn it on manually, the range extender. So then you are able to continue your trip and refill up with gas. And as long as you're not doing over 65, 70 miles an hour or in really hilly, hilly areas, 
you will be able to keep going pretty much as long as you want. Above those speeds, it will still use battery power, so you'll end up having to recharge at some point. So it's not really any stretch of the imagination to see why these never really caught on in the US. Those limitations are pretty severe, but extremely easy to bypass. You can use the same phone app that we use to recode this for the battery to also recode it to think it's in the EU. And then you just put fish and chips in the gas tank and all as well. You get the full use of the gas tank and the full use of the range extender. If I go into the range extender settings, I just turned on hold state of charge mode, which means that now the uh, little two-cylinder parallel twin scooter motor and i'm not joking it is literally the same engine that bmw uses in one of their big step through scooters that thing just kicked on and is now going to do its damnedest to keep the battery at its current state of charge it doesn't really charge it up more because when i stop moving the engine also shuts off so its ability to do anything to actually increase my state of charge is pretty limited, but it'll keep it from going down anymore. So if you know you're gonna want your battery later and you don't mind using gas in the meantime, that's an incredibly useful feature. The engine itself, you can't tell it's back there. This is a, an electric car, so there's not really any noise for it to compete with, but that little two banger back there is dead silent and transmits no vibration. Unlike the Prius, which I've always kind of criticized for how jolting the gas engine is, even in the new ones, when you're rolling off under electric power and you give it more than 3% throttle or whatever and the motor kicks in, it's kind of jarring and really annoying. It never smoothly turns on or off. It was especially bad in the second generations, but I think I rode in a fourth gen and it was the same way. One feature that I've started appreciating almost immediately on this car is the one pedal driving. I've never experienced it before and it's actually cool as heck. As soon as I let off, it starts braking at a pretty reasonable pace. I mean, it's not going to get you out of an emergency situation where a small child has run out in front of your car, but for just driving around, once you learn how to time it, the car will come to a complete stop just by taking your foot off the gas pedal. It's really, really cool. Something else that's really cool is the materials used in this interior, which I'll show you as soon as we get to our next destination here, but I am sitting cocooned in renewable materials that don't feel necessarily cheap, though they are all extremely lightweight. We've got what appears to be some compressed fiberboard, recycled materials. There's a, uh, what's, what, what I appreciate here is that by leaning into the recycled and renewable materials, there's no fake leather or fake materials trying to look like organic materials. It all comes across as a very honest interior and a really unique design. And the seat's actually quite comfy for an economy car like this. This whole thing is very intuitive. The one pedal driving just clicks instantly. There's not much to it at all. Also, BMW continues their trend of having some of the nicest feeling turn signal switches on any car. I was driving a second gen Cayenne yesterday and I couldn't get over how crunchy and cheap feeling the turn signal stock was, which might seem like a nitpick, but touch points are very important. All the things that you interact with the most in a car need to feel quality because that's what gives you the best impression. So let's just go ahead and back it into this parking spot here. Backup camera is excellent by the way, and of course it has all the full radar, so I can just be backing up here and it'll tell me exactly how close I am to things. Will it automatically brake? Not that I remember. <laughs> we could find out. <laughs> so, how long have you had this? Two uh, years now? Uh, yeah, just what, over two years. What sort of fuel economy has this thing been returning for you? Um, so, when I do actually have to use the range extender, it's around 50 to 55 miles per gallon. That's pretty good. So, this is a modern four-door, four-seat car that's getting about the same as what my Insight would get, which is pretty impressive to me and it's a heck of a lot faster than the inside is. So taking a look in the interior here, this is apparently a really strangely specced i8. It's a base model, non-sport, but it has all of the options except for the, uh, the higher end pleather seats, but I actually really prefer this cloth. I don't like leather seats in cars at all. They're too slippery and they get too hot in the summer and these aren't uh, these aren't heated or cooled or anything, are they? They are heated. They are heated, yeah. ooh. So heated cloth, one of my favorites. That's how my E46 is and I love it. All manual controls. 
And of course you got a couple pedals there. And all of these releases for the gas cap, the hood, the trunk, and a manual redundant release for, that's the fuel for door, the, right? The charging? It's for the tr uh, front trunk. Ah, so manual frunk release if this one doesn't work. And if we go look under the frunk, front compartment lid open. Josh showed me this earlier. Pretty hilarious. Yeah, I don't know where that is. That's okay, most of the time I don't either. For the fuel door, if you need to get into it, it's up here. Um, the engine's in the back, but the fuel is kept up here. So if for some reason your battery's dead or on some of these it just doesn't release all the time, they actually have a manual release that is right here. You just have to pull it out. And then you get those little pleasure beads and you keep pulling until it feels weird. <laughs> Put it back in and now your door will open. You have your gas cap and it's got a nifty little holder. And what is the capacity of the gas tank in this? Um, so it is 2.49 gallons. Okay, so it's it's restricted to like one and a half gallons. It's restricted to, um, Normally, right? I believe it's just under two. Ah. And so that's on the original model, which had the smaller battery. There's three battery sizes in this. This is the second one. Um, they came out with 120. Uh, so it was 60, uh, 94, and 120. If you have the 94 or the 120, you will actually get the full gas tank size because the electric range is then actually longer than the full capacity gas tank range. Oh, interesting. So you pay more for more battery and you also get more gas. Yes. How do you open the uh, charging port? Uh, so the charging port actually, as long as the car is unlocked, all you have to do is give it a little push. Oh, okay. It'll open. You got a nice little light in here. You have a little holder for your caps. And so you have your fast charging and then just the regular uh, charging. And you've got little indicators. So if we plug it in, it'll actually change colors depending on what's going on. Well, that's pretty cool. So taking a look at the interior here, um, again, super cool door card design. I love this sort of material. It kind of looks like uh, some packaging material I've seen a few places. And then just, this looks like the phone case I had on my Pixel 3. And then some, I guess there is a little bit of fake leather going on in here, but look at this, it's just, it's a very cool use of materials in this car. And then of course you've got some body color coming in in a few places, notably the steering wheel. The dashboard continues that material all around. And you've got this very generous storage spot up here for your Mentos and your microphone uh, and a very bizarre aspect ratio infotainment. So if we go ahead and start the car with the button here on the world's strangest shifter, which I'll show you later, uh, it won't let you start the car because Josh took the keys. <laughs> the key itself is actually a bit interesting because it's just kind of weirdly wide and flat. And I'm really surprised it's not like a key card like uh, the Teslas have or like my uh, 08 Mazda Miata or CX-5 would have. Uh, I just, I like being able to keep it in the pocket at all times. So we start the car up, LED headlights, auto leveling, very cool. We've got a nice little TFT LCD here for the dashboard. What's weird is the screen itself is only like an inch high. We've got this whole tablet sized thing. The alarm, honestly, that's kind of a nice dinger. Broom, broom. Yeah, it's broom. not really obnoxious like some of them. Yeah, I don't hate that. Oh yeah, and there's like one door. One door per speaker, that's all you get. One in the driver door, one in the passenger door. That's the other feature that this is missing. Oh, the windows are all auto up and down, which is super nice. And power folding mirrors, which is always baller. Yeah. Center stack is very BMW. This is just your standard BMW stuff. I mean, there's nothing much to see here. You've got parking or uh, your collision assist warning on and off, bunch of radio controls. Oh, there's the seat heaters. I didn't see those before. In your vents and whatever Eco Pro Plus means. Auto recirc, and then some real nice steering wheel controls. I always love these jog dials, all your stereo stuff over here, cruise controls over here, and it has radar cruise, which is the best. Absolutely in love with this car already. Standard turn signal stock, wiper stock, 
not standard shifter, sort of like a Prius, the park button is different, but to actually shift it into gear, you click it and then it returns. So I would go forward for drive, and then one back for neutral or two back for reverse. It's not doing it right now because the car isn't technically on all the way, it's just on in quotation marks. Nothing really special about the mirror, not a whole lot special about that. Down in the center stack, pretty typical iDrive style controls, mode switching, and an electronic parking brake. Not a lot to write home about. Generous amounts of center storage here, including an aux in, though unfortunately there is no CarPlay to speak of, though you can get add-on modules there that add that. There is also storage in the armrest. Oh yeah, and then there's storage in the upper armrest as well. Pretty standard stuff. And then there's the world's most odd glove box that just goes way down into the dash. And I love this swooping dash design. That's super cool. That is something that on the fancier models, it does have wood grain. Um, this is all wood instead of this plastic. The same with over here for the gray. Oh yeah, but it's not like, it's not actually wood, is it? It's uh, bamboo. Yes. If I remember correctly, <clears throat> bamboo veneer. I think they actually have a couple different kinds of wood. Oh, neat. Your choice of wood. But it's all sustainable. Yeah, I like it. I love, I, I, I like the uh, zero guilt aspect foot on the brake, push the start button, and everything comes to life. And we can go to, let's see here. It's programmed to one to put this thing into battery hold mode, which is neat. Ugh. You can see power stats, you can see the energy flow, all the typical hybrid stuff that's pretty neat. Comfort information. Oh, that's cool. It'll tell you the effect on range of having your uh, heated seat on and whatnot driving style analysis no thanks i don't want to know my insurance already tries to do that if we dig into settings here we can actually look at the state of charge and also how much electric range we have and since i pushed that number one button we are set to hold state of charge the nav screen is actually pretty good i i don't hate this it's not enough to make me not wish that this had carplay but it's it's pretty okay okay so if we push the brake and push that forward we are now driving. And let's go get this thing on the highway because I am really curious what this is like at speed now that we've just done some around town. And I'm also curious what sort of performance this thing actually has. Ride quality, honestly, these streets aren't the greatest, but the ride quality isn't abhorrent. About to merge on the highway here. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> I mean, it's so drama free. For absolutely no reason, the camera died. So that's fun. We also only have 12 minutes of recording space left. So what you missed was trying out the lane follow or the uh, distance following cruise control, which was super neat and uh, driving down the highway a little bit. This thing, honestly, for being a cheap sort of city commuter car, it's really quiet on the highway. There's just a little bit of wind noise coming from sort of the windshield frame and a little bit of road noise, but with such a tiny contact patch, there's not gonna be a whole lot of road noise. Let's uh, punch it again on this on-ramp. Actually, look, how's it handle? Oh, oh, that's actually really good. And then 50, 60, that's, that's, that's pretty darn respectable. Okay. Resume speed. Sweet. So now we're back on the highway. This thing is kind of the perfect car for anyone who's like gonna spend most of their time in the city. One downside here compared to like the Chevy Volt. In a Volt, if you just put gas in it and you run out of battery, it just becomes a gas car and you can just use the gas engine indefinitely. This doesn't work like that because it still relies on the battery for a whole bunch of its systems. So the range extender really does only extend your range. It can't drive the car, which would be pretty hilarious if somehow the entire car could run off of a 650 cc parallel twin engine. Uh, but there's just, you know, there's just not enough output for that to be feasible. So as a new car, this thing was a pretty terrible proposition compared to that Honda Civic. These were like 50, 60 K brand new, but depreciation has been kind to them. And now their downsides are kind of just more 
livable in comparison because the cheapest one right now on Auto Tempest is about thirteen thousand dollars, and for a range extender model, I, I I wouldn't buy a pure electric one just because it wouldn't fit my personal lifestyle. And honestly, you might as well just get the range extender just so that you have it. And honestly, I'd absolutely love to have one of these. Though you did say that the insurance is uh, kind of ridiculous because if this thing's in a fender bender. They replace the entire monocoque. The entire chassis gets replaced with a brand new carbon fiber unit. I really want one of these. I wish I could afford one. It's, uh, for, for my use case, this thing's absolutely perfect. I just do a little bit of driving around town, usually not more than 100 miles a day, and if I didn't have to pay for most of that, that'd be fantastic. But as much as I do love the, uh, the roundel on the front, I think a Volt is still probably the better buy, especially because you can get first gens for under 10 and yeah. second gens for about the same as these, and that gets you 60 miles of electric range, which is not as good, but literally infinite gas range. Just keep putting gas in it. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's not infinite, but you can go forever on the gas motor if you'd like. So it's 2 a.m. now. I'm exhausted. I'm sure there's more I could say about this, but nothing's coming to mind, so uh, <laughs> thank you yeah, all for watching. <laughs> I, I'm pretty tired, too. I've had about three hours of sleep in the last uh, 36 hours. Yeah, my eyelids are mighty heavy and I still have to go home and, and get ready, so, yep.